of Island Studies has been um, hosting off and on for, oh, nigh on three decades. Um, this is a new iteration of it. We've been doing these now once a month, generally from about October until May. And i um, very, very pleased tonight to have our Ed McDonald here. So my name is Lori Brinklow. I am the coordinator and the um, a, a coordinator of the Institute of Island Studies and the UNESCO Chair in Island Studies and Sustainability. You can read all the things that we do up here. Our offices are just down the hall on the way to the washroom. So if anybody needs the washroom, it's about the third and the fourth door on the left. There's two. We also the, um, have the Master of Arts in Island Studies program, and which I'm a graduate and, and has been associated with for many, many years. Uh, and we still have people coming in, and they might have to bring their own chairs. Uh-oh. <laughs> I know there's one here. There's one chair over one, here. One there, if you're willing to stand. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there's a comfy one over there. Okay. Yes. And I suppose the piano bench is probably empty as well. Anybody wants to sing it, play us a tune? Great. So, um, before I go any further and introduce Ed, usually Jim Randall is here. He's the, uh, the chair of our Institute of Island Studies Executive Committee, and he gets up and says a few words and ends up with the sign-up sheet. If anybody is not on our sign-up sheet and would like to be, we have an Institute of Island Studies a newsletter that comes out once a month, and we promise not to sell our, our uh, mailing list to anybody, and uh, we won't pester you with, with anything except just wonderful news about what's going on <coughs> in Central Island and often Island Studies around the world. So I'll start here. Lisa, I'm sure you're on it already, so that's one I think. And Justin's on it, Mike's on it, maybe I think Ola's okay. on it. Oh, put it that way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, right. So, without further ado, I shall introduce Ed. So, um, I think it was a, probably January 12th. I looked at my Island Lecture Series list and I thought, oh, geez, I, January 15th is coming up and the buzz deadline is coming up. And if anybody here knows anything about organizing events, you have to organize them before. <coughs> the 15th of the next month, right, just so that you can get in the bus. So I thought, oh, I don't have a lecture for February. So I sent an email to Ed, and I said, Ed, would you happen to have a lecture in your back pocket? And about two minutes later, he emailed me back. He said, sure. So I said, okay, that's great, but I need a description by tomorrow. He said, okay, <laughs> and he did it. And this is what we have tonight. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with uh, the work of Ed McDonald, teaches history here at he is an author of uh, a number of books, including If You're Strong Hearted, Prince Edward Island in the 20th Century, and a co-editor of um, Time and a Place, which is an environmental history of Prince Edward Island, co-published by Island Studies Press and McGill Queen's Universities Press. And uh, Josh McFadgen is here, I know, he's been helping with the chairs, he is one of the co-authors of that book. I know that Ed is going to talk about the um, book that he's been working on with his another co-author, Alan McEachern, who just happens to be here and didn't realize he was on the bill, um, <laughs> from uh, University of Western Ontario. And um, so I've known Ed for many, many years, and I knew him when he was Eddie. And somebody still emailed, <laughs> you still are, okay. And so somebody emailed me today and said, I was just listening to Eddie on the radio. And I thought, wow, you've known him for a really long time. <laughs> so I'm really thrilled that you're here to share your love of history with us and your knowledge of tourism. And thank you, Ed McDonald. Thank you.
And so I had to wrestle with some of the big themes. And environment is one of the big themes. So uh, I'm supposed to be giving a paper on this with Alan, if he comes with me uh, later this spring in Dubrovnik. Um, and so you're the dry run. So if it doesn't work, we don't get to go on the road. Um, so, the goose and the golden egg, I guess you can guess what the goose is. And the golden egg, the environmental turn in island tourism. So what do we mean by environment? Well, we could talk at length about that. But what I want to talk about specifically today is a layering of the idea of environment and tourism and PEI. An incremental kind of a layering. It's not a progression per se because each of these adds on to the other layers. So from the very beginning of tourism on Prince Edward Island, and much to our astonishment, uh, it goes back to the mid-1800s, the pastoral landscape has been among, if not the main attraction of PEI. Beginning in the 1970s, Tourism promoters, if not people involved in natural history, started recognizing that nature on Prince Edward Island, as people usually kind of imagine it, meaning wilderness, and I put quotation marks around that because the you know, wildlife on PEI is mostly down in the clubs. Um, <laughs> or at least when I was a university student, it was at the Travens. Um, <laughs> But they became attracted to the idea of environmental tourism. At the same time as the government is taking a bigger hand in the promotion and the imaging of the island as a tourist attraction and tourism numbers are exploding, with the development plan era there's an idea that we need to you know, protect the environment. There is a fragility there. But the idea is we need to protect it for tourists. And gradually that didn't get replaced, but was overlaid with a realization, and I think one that strong most of you here tonight, that we also need to protect the environment from tourists. Now, we've all been tourists, so this is not an accused tourist statement. I think every single individual in the room has played tourists. So that's, those are the four things that we're going to uh, try to cover in the next two hours and 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> uh, this is just a little uh, squib. What do we mean by the impact of the tourism industry on the environment? It can mean a pressure on resources. It can mean you know, harm to, I'm sorry, um, things like our habitat, harms to, um, I guess, animals or wildlife. And literally, We've got the threat of pollution. And I've refined Wong because Wong is writing earlier in the 2000s and uh, uh, specifically in recent years, increasingly we're concerned with travel itself and you know, the carbon emissions that that travel is adding to the environment. That's not an issue in 1990 where my story ends, but I think we have to mention it at least in the process of the lecture. Some tourism numbers, here's what we're talking about. Tourism estimates uh, vary, and they are estimates. Uh, tourism will tell you they are more reliable than the tourism stats any place else in Canada. But the definitions change over time, and so the estimates should be taken with a grain of salt, sea salt. But you can see 1951, estimated tourism 35,000. 13 years later, it's 330,000. A decade after that, it's 573,000. In recent times, I think we broke the million mark in 1997. And just this morning, I was looking up some numbers, and the estimate for last year was 1.58 million visitors. But we don't calculate it in the same way that we did in 1950. Starting assumptions, the place of place. Well, I've already mentioned that, but I'll just show you a few slides. Uh, this is the evidence part, because I'm supposed to be an academic 
and so I'm supposed to have evidence for the things that I tell you. Um, this is the famous report done in the mid-60s on the major industries of PEI by Acres Consulting from Toronto, and this is the foundational work for the development plan that was signed in 1969, and it has these experts who are trying to qualify and quantify what the attraction is on Prince Edward Island. And it's basically talking about the pastoral landscape is our major resource, according to their research, unspoiled agrarian landscapes, uh, which to them are as important in terms of environments as wilderness, such as you might go see in northern Ontario. What were tourists doing when they came to Prince Edward Island in 1965? Uh, the most listed activity, and it's still the number one activity, is sightseeing, touring the landscape. Is it the favorite activity? No, it's almost accidental. The favorite activity in 65, um, most popular activity, sorry, was doing that touring. Second most popular swimming, however you define that. And the percentage of people camping or staying in parks, 23%. Um, and yeah, for those of us who are advocating for a new museum for Prince Edward Island, the Central Museum, uh, hopefully the numbers have gone up. The story hasn't changed significantly. This is a departmental report from 1988-89, and again, it talks about the quality of our natural environment it is and will remain the most vital element of the province's economy. I'm not going to read all of these to you because I'm assuming you can all read English. So Acres advised and the development plan proposed that in order to preserve the pastoral landscape, that visitors like to see, which is our main attraction, we need to pass regulations. <coughs> we need to protect it, protect the park-like atmosphere, and that's going to mean land use planning. <coughs> uh, as you know, even today, uh, zoning and land use planning for the countryside is not particularly popular among those who are going to be planned and zoned and regulated. Also was saying we also have to protect access to the shoreline. So the tourism landscape had to be subjected to rational, control, consistent planning. Remember, this is the development plan era where there's a great belief. The post-war era had this tremendous kind of belief in the efficacy of good planning to solve all problems. Sort of the game plan for the Maple Leafs in the last 50 some years. Um, you may recognize here the Knox family, I believe, camping. Oh, uh, we the PI National Park. Um, so the summer hotel gave way to the bungalow, the cottage, but increasingly in the post war era, more and more people were camping. Were they camping because they loved nature? As a teenager, when I went camping, I can assure you, it's not because I love nature. Uh, part of the reason was because baby boomer families couldn't afford to stay in hotels. It was cheaper to camp. Potentially more fun. Uh, so, provincial parks start growing up across the province like, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. Yep. A, a, a series of mushrooms after it rains. <laughs> The PI National Park in 1952, Alan, I'm not sure if I got this staff from you, it looks pretty low, 243, by 1962, 39,000. Provincial parks in 1958, we had one. But look at how the numbers increase exponentially. The number of campers in private campgrounds and provincial campgrounds, the number of the provincial parks. The province sees this as a cheap way to build an infrastructure for enjoying the environment. Question. Question. Yes. On that previous slide, would that be visitor nights stayed 
Uh, it is users, so they wouldn't necessarily <coughs> be overnight users. It could be, because a lot of islanders are going to the provincial parks as well as a day user. Yeah, they'd have to go a lot uh, in 1977, have over a million when... Yeah, those are not overnight campers. That's the people who are there on a day trip. But and if those people who stayed for a week and there was five in the family, that would be, you know, 35 visits. That's the, yeah, these are important points, and they... But that is why I raise the specter of the statistics yeah. with a certain caveat. Okay. Uh, there are people here who have worked for the Department of Tourism. And, uh, they can speak to statistics better than I can. But I was called into the office a couple of years ago and I said they were notoriously erratic statistics. Um, I'm just trying to line it up to the visitors. <laughs> and I have no meeting with the Department of Staff. Um, they're very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Park development. This is a. I just threw in a couple of quotes here because the concept of nature and the concept of environment, as expressed in the reports, show a kind of schizophrenia. Park development, best program ever undertaken, conserves natural kinds of resources, land, forests, and water, and wildlife, creates employment, blah, blah, blah. So then they talk about a cabin park and put a road through the woods, which is incidentally growing on a range of sand hills. So we put a road right through it. And at Lord Selkirk Park, they put up a bunch of floodlights because it was a really cool effect at night. <laughs> okay, so sensibilities have changed, which is not, I don't mean to make fun of them, but you can see the, the concept of nature is human-centered. Uh, with that kind of observation. Just a couple of um, signposts on the way to taking environment in a more coherent fashion. These are the categories of provincial parks, nature reserves, natural environment parks, you know, you know, recreation areas, etc. Um, so there are various different kinds of parks, not all of them oriented towards nature. This is all I'm trying to say with that. The stated kind of goal to protect outstanding areas of natural, cultural, historic, and scientific significance for the recreational and educational use of present and future generations. That kind of a boilerplate recurs over and over again. In the development plan of 1969, uh, it lays out what Acres had recommended. More tourists spread out across the seasons, spread out across our landscape, staying longer and spending more. That's the mantra that we've followed for the last 50 some years. And uh, they, they want total expenditure to be $18 million by the 10th year of the plan. To do that, they want to control how tourists experience the landscape, again, by land use, planning, and regulation, and control. Um, the actuality falls well short of the plan. It's a very thorough, comprehensive approach to protect the sort of kind of integrity of the landscape for tourists' enjoyment. By the 70s, there was a perception that that landscape needed the protection. That it was a fragile landscape. Something we had not appreciated in 1920, say. So how do we keep up appearances? Well, first of all, this is a reminder that there are imminent threats to the environment. An oil tanker that sinks off the north shore of Prince Edward Island, it's filled with a pollutant. The bunker C oil is in the hull. The hull is sealed, but at any time the hull could rupture and we could have a disaster on our beaches, such as had been in the news with other wrecks like, um, I was going to say the Avro Arrow, that was an airplane. Um, Exxon Valdez. The Exxon Valdez, yeah. At the same time, tourists are starting to complain about the tacky commercialization of what in the 60s had been seen as a pristine 
unspoiled landscape. These are letters. This is a great place. People can write, write to the Premier, and the Premier will reply. So these are from the Campbell files. Uh, people writing to the Premier to complain about the commercialization of our environment. Don't turn PEI into an, um, I'm sorry, another Niagara Falls. It's a bit amusing when you consider the highest waterfall in Prince Edward Island. <laughs> it's no taller than I am. Um, <laughs> the crossroads of Cavendish, I don't think I need to read that of all that in Cavendish. <coughs> Surely your government will not be responsible for the desecration of one of the most inestimable <coughs> treasures, the purity and natural beauty of Prince Edward Island. And those are just examples. There are many more examples. And so, the government does something I find extremely interesting. They create a department of environment and tourism. Physically linking the two things, and they put environment first. And this, again, this is kind of a boilerplate, but this is from uh, the introduction to a report, so these are the words of the minister. Uh, environment, tourism, closely related. Islanders are concerned about both. Principal idea is to recognize and place emphasis upon this close association <coughs> Our mission is to manage a rapidly growing tourist industry in such a manner as to minimize the conflicts between tourism, agriculture, and other environmental concerns. I think that crack I made about the Department of Tourism may be coming back to haunt me. That's not going to call it, is it? <laughs> um, so you want to have your cake and eat it too. Tourism and environment are not in conflict. They're partners. And uh, this is uh, the various different ways the departments are organized. I've always you know, maintained that it's actually the movers who control our government. Because every year or two they reorganize all the departments and everybody has to relocate. I think if you get to the bottom of this, you will find that. <laughs> Talk to Foley's, you know, Rush's, <laughs> Jenkins. Um, but uh, Department of Tourist Development, Environment and Tourism, Tourism, Parks and Conservation. Tourism and Parks is a durable uh, twinning. And legislation is enacted, a lot of which we have forgotten. Not all of it inspired by a desire to protect the environment for tourists, but that's a consideration. Signage Act. Lots of fallout about the Signage Act. Thank goodness we passed it. <coughs> the promotional signs. Can beer banned? <laughs> anyway. Islanders taxed to remove derelict car bodies. 17,000 of them were removed. And I believe there's now approximately 16,000 more derelict car bodies. <laughs> because everybody knows that's littering the tourist landscape. They're all turned into you know, gardens. Um, Non-refillable soft drink bottles. Banned. And there's a lot written about that. And it is to protect some local industry. But it's also to prevent litter, aluminum pop cans banned. And that reminds us that um, for a lot of islanders, protecting the environment meant keeping the ditches clean and protecting us from the signage of billboards. And you just have to drive in New Brunswick, sorry if I'm here from New Brunswick, to understand the kind of visual kind of pollution that that offers. So blah, 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 it's not just a change of name, it's a commitment to the people of the province and to tourists, but they don't vote. Uh, here is a garbage a in Kensington from 1971. Was anyone here at the garbage a -thon? I can't, uh, I can't read most of the signs, but most of them are saying, don't, you know. Well, actually, one seems to be saying Trudeau. 
<laughs> so, I'm not sure what the message was with that. Fight pollution. Gordon Bennett, I'm sure. Something hardworking, loyal. Okay, maybe we shouldn't look too closely at, at that rally. Here's a tourist guide, a visitor's guide from uh, circa 1965, showing you the landscape that tourists enjoy and spraying pesticides on their crops. <laughs> Just to make sure that the mosquitoes and the you know, potato bugs don't, don't you know, ruin your vacation. Um, they wouldn't do that in the 1970s. That's the point I'm trying to make. This is a shot from the 50s. Alan has, at one point, he, I think he termed this the discovery of sex in island tourism. Um, that's a paraphrase of what you said, Alan. But here they are. Hang out on the dunes. This is not good. In a tourism film from the early 70s, they say, we used to take our sand dunes for granted. Now we take care of them. Get the hell off the dunes. <laughs> so I want to talk about uh, case studies now for the next little while. Um, but mostly so that I can show you again my clever logo thing. <laughs> um, tourism and the quest for a second national park, which is something that we talk about in the tourism book. And Alan McEachern has written uh, a wonderful book on the national parks in the Atlantic Canada region, the first of the four national parks. This is a map of the national park. Uh, and it shows you something that concerned the Parks Canada people greatly by the 1970s, actually by the 60s, and that is, it is a very narrow strip of land along the seashore. And the original conception of the National Park was wilderness when they were first beginning to be organized. And Cavendish is not wilderness. It's a recreational landscape. So by the mid-60s, the attendance at the National Park was skyrocketing. And look at our ranking. We're the second most visited National Park in Canada. These are taken from Alan's book, which is still in print and for sale. Um, I wouldn't say that, but Alan was here. Um, they need more room. And they're thinking about their wilderness mandate. And so Parks Canada is actively looking for more land on Prince Edward Island. And the government of PEI is looking for a second national park because they're seen as economic anchors of development in Peru. Yes? What happened in 2011? Are three zeros missing? Or? Uh, no, they started charging for one thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a whole other story. Islanders' you know, resistance to being charged admission to get into their own national have officially plummeted. I believe, yes. I had a very hard, I, I actually a hard time finding some statistics, which is kind of why I kind of used Alan's book and then I jumped forward in time to one statistic that I did have. You will notice, however, that I have stamped the postcard. Well done. <laughs> I tried to, to pay attention to details. Here is the proposed second national park. Parks Canada looked at a number of sites that the province was interested in, and it was most interested in the eastern tip of Prince Edward Island. I've already lectured on this before, so I'll try to keep it brief. Um, but a much larger swath of land, uh, the population in it had been falling, but it was still sprinkled with farms, fishers, and residents, summer residents, and some of the full-time residents. This is, of course, you have the lighthouse at East Point. Very interesting natural landscape, especially along the coast with some rare plants and lichens. I won't go any further than that. There are some naturalists in the audience who would say there's a lot more to say than that. Naturally very important. I'll leave it at that. South Lake, beautiful beaches, and people in the eastern part of PEI who were lobbying for a national park 
envisaged these beaches thronged with people. And Parks Canada envisaged them looking more or less like that. <laughs> this is my clever map of the proposed, the boundaries were somewhat elastic over the course of negotiations, but this is more or less what they settled on from Basin Head, North Lake. Uh, there are a couple of problems. One was Parks Canada was moving away from, but still locked into a policy that provinces turned land over to them empty of people. People were not seen as part of the natural landscape. This was going to cause problems because there were a bunch of people who lived in the national park you know, area, and already in Newfoundland and New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, Parks Canada was running into some real trouble <coughs> with people who didn't really want to move out of the park in order for it to become a tourist attraction. And that was going to be an issue here, and Parks Canada was evolving a transitional sort of a policy. Ultimately, they agreed to let people stay within the park as long as they were practicing traditional occupations and maintained their premises according to the standards set by the people at parks. And I believe if you move for any reason, if you left the community, the property would pass to parks and would be back to wilderness. We never really got to find out how that would translate into action because it was 1973, there was a lot of you know, local opposition, especially after people in the Surrey area found out this kind of development was not going to be allowed on the boundaries of the National Park. So you had the eastern end of the island saying, okay, so there'll be a few jobs in a wilderness park, no commercial development, and a bunch of people living in the park are going to lose their homes or be allowed to stay as long as they're willing to be exhibits in the zoo. The Premier, admittedly in an, you know, an election year, but an election that he won very handily, listened, went to a meeting, and tore up the agreement with parks. Told the people of the area, if you want a national park, we'll leave it to you to negotiate that with the people at Parks Canada. We're not going to force it down your throat. And this was, uh, this just as a little quote from the minister, you may have heard of him, Jean Chrétien, mm -hmm. uh, what he felt, or what someone who wrote the letter for him felt, was the purpose of national parks. Not tourist promotion, but preserve the natural landscape of Canada. So, second national park doesn't come about. The denouement of that story is going to be what happens at Greenwich, uh, basically 15 years later. In the meantime, government is beginning to appreciate, tourism is beginning to appreciate that nature is a tourist attraction. Not just the pastoral landscape, but the natural <coughs> landscape, which includes our version of you know, kind of wilderness. And in 1988, uh, we adopted a tourism strategy called Tourism 2000. Sounds like a lower named automobile. Uh, no, that's the Pontiac 2000. Um, tourist attractions must be appropriate to our environment in harmony with the conservation, the presentation of that, the preservation of that environment. Those are two of the principles for Tourism 2000. This awareness, <coughs> sensitivity, at least on paper, that nature must be preserved and protected as part of tourism, part of th that kind of development. In 1988, in fact, uh, there was a tourism theme called Touch Nature. And this is what... It's interesting because I lost half of the... Page. It was a two-page spread, um, touch nature, but then the next year was the 125th anniversary of the Charlottetown Conference, so we had to add that theme, and then the next year was We're Akin to Ireland, and then the next year after that was The Road to the Isle. Touch nature continued, but it lost top star ability. We had a green tourism study by Smith Green. Total coincidence, Smith Green did a green tourism study. Um, 
for Smith Green, green tourism meant nature tourism. That's how they kind of interpreted it. Travelers' primary objective is to enable visitors to experience and enjoy nature firsthand. <coughs> but in package, what it interpreted as green uh, were a lot of things that people were doing anyway. Just recast it as green tourism. Whale and seal watching. I don't know how many of you have seen whales frequently while traveling along the coastlines of PEI. There's a mansion in Cable Head up the road from our cottage which has a whale watching tower on it. And I have never seen a whale in the 11 years we've had a cottage there, but then the house is for sale too. Um, birding, nature art, but also hiking, cycling, riding, beachcombing, skating, skiing, windsurfing, sailing, canoeing, kayaking, snorkeling. You have to be fitter than I am. Uh, consuming land, sea, and starscapes. All of that's interpreted as green tourism. And this is a reflection of the fact that tourism marketing is beginning to specialize. It's segmenting the market and focusing, uh, targeting certain groups and demographics. And there is a green tourism sort of a demographic. It's a little dangerous to uh, put all of your eggs in one environmental kind of you know, basket. Uh, does anybody remember Elephant Rock? <laughs> I, saw, I went to see Elephant Rock. And it was impressive. didn't last. Something that was a lot more successful and touted at the time as green tourism is the Confederation Trail, the conversion of this industrial railbed into green tourism. And just a couple of shots. John, I don't know if you took any of those pictures. You did take this one. Um, we have a picture that John took later. But the Confederation Trail has been enormously successful. The poster child for the conflict, the emerging conflict between the tourism industry and environmentalism <coughs> is the controversy over Greenwich. And this is worth probably a separate lecture or a separate article. Um, Greenwich is an environmentally sensitive, environmentally significant part of Prince Edward Island and it contains the earliest evidence of habitation by us. Uh, on PEI, and it had been in private hands since the late 1960s, and there had been development proposals put forward repeatedly. This is a little map of the area from a planning study in 1981, and this is what they were proposing to do in that iteration of the resort plan for Greenwich. There was going to be an 18-hole golf course, a marina, a little public access beach for the rest of us, but most of it was going to be reserved for a commercial hotel and lots of private <coughs> residential development. The province was caught in the middle because it had declared the Greenwich area a special planning conservation area in 1975. And thus, you couldn't just go ahead and develop the property even if you owned it. And in 1988, the Island Nature Trust took up the cause of protecting the site from development for tourism. <coughs> Local people were not well pleased in general. One of the interviewees claimed 9 out of 10 of the residents in the area were in favor of the development because it was going to provide jobs, drive up property values, um, improve the quality of their life. And as one of the residents whose name I've left out, uh, a mild man, to be quite honest with you, a very mild-mannered man. Uh, they're so damn much concerned about maintaining the natural beauty in Greenwich by people who don't live there. Um, so tourism and environment and local people are often in conflict. The upshot of it all is that there is a long uh, court case. Um, the, I think capital investment was scared off by the fact that there is no rapid approval of the development plans. Whether or not the capital was there from the beginning is another question. Ultimately in 1995 the province acquired the site in a land swap with the, the you know, latest owner and developer and three years later it turned the site over to Parks Canada to become a new annex to the National Park. So 
the national park finally got its wilderness area. Smaller than the one they had in, kind of envisaged. This is, uh, I forget how many acres. 1,400 acres? Yeah. Anyway, we've all been there. They were going to build an eco-lodge. The conservationists supposed that. Some uh, extreme opinion maintained that no visitors should be allowed at all in Greenwich. <coughs> Ultimately, Parks Canada decided to set a quota of 100,000 people per year. And I don't know what the visitation is currently, but I can tell you it's not 100,000 people per year. But it is going up <coughs> significantly. But it's probably still in the tens of thousands. The environment, tame and semi-wild, continues to draw attention. Uh, this is a promotional image for John's book. John's here in the audience, a photographer whose work I've always greatly admired. Um, and he's trying to show us the wilderness aspects of Prince Edward Island in a province that we don't usually associate with wilderness. This is not a guide to <coughs> drinking establishments, as I said earlier. In the end, however, despite our occasional romance with green tourism and protecting the environment for tourists, uh, and nature, for most people, you know, nature and PEI is still a beach. This is from the current Tourism PEI website. This is a, a, a recent ad I looked just, I found this the other day. One amazing island, an empty landscape, empty, ready to be filled with your experiences, to be filled with your expectations and dreams. <laughs> Which brings us to where I would like to conclude, which is with the threat to the environment from tourism. The necessity not just to protect the environment for tourists, but to protect it from tourists. The fastest growing industry in the world is tourism. Global statistics, and I have some, but I didn't put them in the slide. The global statistics are staggering. Cruise ship touring is the fastest growing element in the tourism industry. Can you just ask how many people here have been on a cruise of any kind? It could be changing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Speaking of environmental disasters, uh, this is one of those days which occurs several times a, a, a summer, or a couple of times a summer, where there are four cruise ships in the harbor at the same time. Cruise ship tourism is being somewhat arraigned in the court of opinion now because of the carbon emissions that are associated with it and um, uh, their treatment of waste. Uh, we could talk about cruise ship tourism and its impact on PEI tourism. There are lots of limitations. It brings a lot of people to downtown Charlottetown, and it brings a lot of people to Cavendish. It doesn't send too many people to Tignish or to you know, Basinhead or Surrey. But environmentally, it poses a problem, and it exposes a central issue for tourism. By definition, tourism involves travel. By definition, travel involves at this current stage of our you know, development, carbon emissions, whether you travel by automobile, or airplane, or a cruise ship. If you want to walk or cycle, yes, that is more green. Not all of us can do that. Carbon emissions are spawning another problem, and that is a warming climate, which is leading to sea level rise, and we have a climate lab here <coughs> which is uh, leading the way in Canada in many ways with exploration of climate change. This is the projection that it has for you know, Lennox Island if sea levels continue to rise. And you can see um, these areas underwater. This is Clive, this is the computer program, this is Clive's version of Charlton, mm -hmm. positing a sea level rise of three meters, I believe. 
Luckily, I'm on the fourth floor of the Dominion Building. <laughs> <coughs> so, tourism and environment are both partners and in conflict. Uh, so, the choices that we make going forward as tourists, as you know, governments, as tourism authorities, are going to have to take increasing account of the impact of tourism on the environment after a century of mainly focusing on what the environment does for tourism. 40 minutes. Be the most interesting part <laughs> because I think people bring a lot to this discussion about environment and tourism. And some people have a long history with PEI and with some of the issues that were talked about in this talk. It's always the risk when you do the recent past in history is that too many people have remembered it. No one's going to argue with me about what happened in 1777, <laughs> uh, except for Harry Homer. Uh, but uh, fewer people. <laughs> but I, I am interested, actually, in, in your observations, experiences, your questions. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. And if you like the lecture, um, you know, credit me. And if, if you had problems with it, <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mark. Uh, when did all the golf courses appear? Ah, yes. I, I, I wrestled with whether to include golf courses in their talk because golf courses are an environmental history topic uh, because they also take a toll on the environment and they're seen as green tourism and sustainable tourism. But for one thing, they use a hell of a lot of water. Um, <clears throat> first ever golf course, um, 1903 or so, I think there were some nine-hole courses at... Uh, you know, tourism hotels, but the course here in town at Belvedere is the first real you know, golf course. And there were still only a handful of them in the early 1990s when uh, the tourism department decided to make us the garden of the golf. I've been trying to copyright that line. Uh, no one's adopting it. Uh, garden of golf, perfect. Uh, a lot of money was spent encouraging the development of golf courses. Uh, some of it, a lot of it spent by the government, but also a lot of investment with government assistance. And we went from, I wish I could remember the stats off the top of my head, but from five courses, say, in the late 70s to something like 25 or 27 courses. Uh, we overbuilt, and some of the money was wasted. And we found a couple of intractable problems in trying to become a Myrtle Beach. One is you can't golf here year-round. And two, because you can't, you need locals to play golf. And if the green fees are set at what people from Toronto think is cheap, it's still pretty high for Islanders to play. And so we've had trouble uh, getting beyond a certain kind of point as a golfing sort of destination. Although we have some beautiful courses. And we, we do try to have them. But that's mostly from the 1990s, early 2000s. By 2005, we had overbuilt and we were starting to pull back. And something about tour, that in the manuscript. The first tourism golf course was at Cavendish. Yes, and that was in the 1930s, designed by Stanley Thompson, one of the great golf course architects uh, in North America at the time. Uh, and that was definitely a tourist uh, kind of oriented course. Summerside, of course. Um, you had Rustico uh, by the 1970s, a lot less ambitious than you know, Cavendish, but then it cost less to play at Rustico. Um, but the big expansion is, is in the 1990s through to about 2003. So that's a, that's a really good point. But I didn't put it in the talk. I thought I had too much material anyway. But it is environment.
Yes, over oh, here. Oh, sorry, there were questions. Uh, <clears throat> when I came here tonight, I, I was, I guess I was, I, I was hoping that there would be some good news. And, and <laughs> although you don't explicitly say so, that the new, what you paint is, is really bad news. It's not very good. I, <coughs> I was born on another island, similar to Prince Edward Island, which is Sicily, that was an uh, agricultural uh, landscape, much like PEI is and was, uh, that, that there was great poverty because <coughs> you can't make money off, off the land. And the Italian government, you may be aware of what happened in Sicily, is that there were bonuses given to people, to farmers and to any entrepreneur to uh, encourage tourism. And that, that has taken off quite well, but the harm that it's doing, I suspect, is no less than the harm that's being done by the tourists that come here, or the tourists that go there. But, so I, I, I really don't know what the answer is, that I'm, I'm at odds that, that people need, need to work here. Uh, that, that the things that we complain about is the, is the thing that provides money to the government so that they can provide all the services that we all enjoy. So we all like the services, but we certainly don't like how, how we're making that money. So I don't know what the answer is. I, well, I, well, the good news is that I'm an historian, <coughs> so I know diddly squat I'm, I'm sorry? the future. I'm an historian. Uh, I predict the past. Um, <laughs> so I don't... My observations about the future should be taken with a grain of salt. Um, but the other aspect of that um, is, I think, a central point that Alan and I are trying to leave people with the manuscript of the book, and the, the book is largely written, um, is we're lucky on Prince Edward Island. First of all, agriculture is the number one industry still. Since 1970 or earlier, people have been you know, predicting the imminent dominance of tourism, that it will soon be the number one industry. And agriculture is still the number one industry. And unlike some of the destinations on islands, tourism is not the only industry, nor the tail that wags the dog. Another piece of good news for Prince Edward Island is that we are still, as a society, in control of our tourism industry. It is not controlled by capital from off-island at least not yet. And so we have the ability as a government and as an economy to make the decisions we need to make to try to make tourism sustainable. Um, Alan and I have talked at various times about the argument about whether tourism is an extractive industry that uses up a society, that uses <coughs> up a culture and a landscape, or whether it's a sustainable industry. And I think it depends on the choices that you and we still have the ability to make those. We have to choose wisely. And so every time we have a lecture where we talk about uh, things like this, it increases understanding, and understanding is the foundation of wisdom. So I'm not saying I'm wise, but we're building collectively wisdom. So that's good news. All of those are good news. Uh, but the tourism industry has saved all it takes. I mean, there are, there are a number of things that have to happen for there to be a tourism industry in a global sense. Stability, uh, safety, cheap transportation, etc. Things over which we have no control on Prince Edward Island. Those things could destabilize the tourism industry. But I, I think one of the saving graces is that that the tourism is limited to a short period of time of the year. Unlike, unlike the islands, some islands that are, they are paradises year round, that the, the, the pressure on those places is a lot greater than it would ever be on, on the island. So that perhaps That's, is one of the things that might be the same. That, that is a really good point. That's a really good point. And one of the concepts currently in vogue is over tourism. Um, over tourism, places being overrun and used up so that the local people feel they have lost control over their society and their environment. And physically, places like the Louvre, uh, um, physically, places being used up. And when there's no kind of you know, respite from the tourism season, fatigue sets in and resentment sets in. So, yeah. 
we keep wanting to expand our season into the shoulders, and our shoulders are still, you know, we've been working out for decades, but our shoulders are still pretty narrow. That maybe is a good thing. I think you make an excellent point. Question over here, Ed. I'm going to throw out a rather undemocratic idea. Um, it seems like there is a fairly growing pressure on uh, of tourism on our island. Why not raise the price? Why not? Why doesn't the government put some more taxes on entry, hotel stays, on all sorts of things? Make it more expensive. It is not democratic. I'll admit that, but it would slow it down. It would create more profit for the island, possibly allowing it to reduce taxes on the residents and so on. And if it's a precious thing, price it higher, make it, you know, more dear to come here. It would slow down the volume. The private, you know, hotel operators might scream, "Oh, I'm trying to expand," but you know, maybe it would lower their taxes or something like that. But it would allow us to stem the tide, maybe make it more financially sustainable from the island's point of view, and take the pressure off the resource itself as well. That's an interesting idea as well, and it, it, it raises two points in, in my mind, uh, uh, one of which is something that we discuss in the chapter where the environment comes up, and that is tourism levies uh, have proven intensely unpopular with the tourism industry. Uh, even when the, I'm sorry, the money is used for the tourism industry. But the second thing that occurs to me is in the last 15 years, you do see a subtle shift in promotion and marketing. In the 70s, we were going for mass, as many tourists as possible. We are subtly shifting our message uh, that we would be willing to countenance fewer tourists with more money, staying longer, spending more. So if your revenue may not go down without the numbers going up, if the tourists that you get, um, and if you spread them out a little, not through the winter, but we just had Jack Frost. But uh, so there are possibilities there if there is enough public concern about the tourism industry to support that kind of regulation. But my not sense, an election year. My sense is Costa Rica has gone this model of higher quality, higher dollar tourism. Yeah, and, but, and not quite as big a volume. Yeah. I simply don't know. Sorry, Al. Well, that, but that <laughs> is based on the fact that we there's a feeling we have too many tours. Do we have too many tours? No. <laughs> and it, as someone who operates a, 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 a well, a marketplace like the handicap industry relies very heavily on tours. So, uh, so does the uh, the whole artist community, mm -hmm. theater, and part in part fostered. By the it would, tourism it would not exist if yeah. it wasn't for tourism. Yeah. Fostered in part by the tourism. Yeah. But, but, but Alan, coming back to your question, do we have too many tours? That's one of the, the kind of rhetorical questions that is difficult to answer. How many tourists is too many tourists? How many tourists can touch sorry, nature before nature gets ruined? Um, tourism industry recently, we're talking about we could have a lot more tourists. We need more tourists. In the 1970s, one report said we could stand 3 million tourists a, a year. No, Only no. one report. Well, my question wasn't that. My question was, do we feel we have too many tourists? Ah, and that's as important. Well, if you feel you have too many tourists, then you have too many tourists. Well, I'm just sort of asking the room. <laughs> Mr. Malala, as someone who worked, as I recall, at Greenwich. Yeah, I did it for years. Uh, for um, and there was actually an island in the Philippines that was basing its tourism strategy after Prince Edward Island, uh, called Guimaras, uh, 1995 thesis at Dal, in fact, down, got it, pretty good. Um, Pinterest, I think her name was. But uh, um, the, the question I had was about um, um, the idea of, you mentioned there was a twinning at one point, Ireland, I think, and PEI was one of the tourism strategies. Is there an interest in, in that in an ecotourism sense where, for example, the idea of tracking piping plovers in the summer here and then piping plovers in, say, the Turks and Caicos in the um, winter? Um, the other side of the coin that I was looking at is looking over a long time of, of tourism 
numbers. Um, the anecdote would be William and Kate could only go to Cavendish, Charlottetown, and Summerside because it was their first time on PEI. And if it was their second, third, or fourth time, then they'd get out to Surrey or to Nish. Um, that maybe those numbers of, of, of strain that are seen are in the center of the island, not on the edges, that have seen more tourism since the bridge came into fact to factor. Um, we're just seeing a different, a different tourism infrastructure there. So I guess it, I guess I had kind of two questions. It's probably cheating. Uh, <laughs> is that notion but of year-round tourism and then uh, year-round ecotourism, but also the edges of it different than the center? First, uh, with a very interesting idea to twin with another place for ecotourism, for example, following the migration of birds, say. Um, as far as I know, that's not been done. The twinning of the island in Ireland, uh, while County Monaghan Tourism Board did establish a rapport with the island, we didn't really <coughs> twin with Ireland. We basically were marketing ourselves as, if you can't afford to go to Ireland, we're the next best thing, because we sort of look like Ireland, and there's a bunch of Irish people here. Uh, that particular line of marketing didn't work very well, because it alienated people who weren't Irish and were in the tourism industry. And we were in the middle of a recession, and so the numbers didn't tend to support putting the emphasis. So they did two years of that, and then they backed away from it. But your idea for eco-tourism twinning is a fascinating one. You wouldn't have mass kinds of tourism. You wouldn't have mass tourism. One of the um, other you know, kinds of developments, during the 60s and 70s, we were marketing ourselves to baby boomer families, so young families and their kids. Uh, by the 1980s, we were beginning to target a different sort of a demographic, a dink, double income, no kids. So affluent, middle class people who don't have to be home by Labor Day because their kids are not going to school because they're empty nesters. Um, so, that creates a little bit of um, latitude in terms of who you target to do the sorts of things that you propose. And I can't remember the second part of... Just kind of at the center of the island. Like oh, yes. The Golden Triangle uh, is heavily still the most touristed area. <coughs> whether that's because they had a head start, whether that's because there's more to see there, or there's more to see there because that's where the tourists go, is there a chicken or the egg kind of thing. But they've been trying since 1965 to spread tourists across the island uh, with limited kinds of, of success. Partly because we're a small island and you can stay in Charlottetown and take a day trip to Tignish and come back and stay in a, like an accommodation in Charlottetown again. Um, but you're right, that central part, if there are too many tours, or you know, like a perception that there is, it's the central part of PEI and the city on a rainy day. Try parking in Charlottetown on a rainy day in July or August. I can remember someone coming to see me when I worked at Beaconsfield, and we drove uptown to have lunch, and we ended up back in a parking spot at Beaconsfield. <laughs> and walking back uptown because we couldn't find a place to park. So overcrowding um, in the central part of the island, you're right, Surrey is not overcrowded. <coughs> Possibly, you know, basin head on a nice day on the zone. Uh, Justin uh, had a question here. Yes, and okay, and I better, I better let a couple of other questions yeah. before we come back. Thank you. Uh, is there any way to uh, classify tourists among, you know, among groups? Let's say people who care about the environment, people who not care about the environment, and maybe we can focus on the pool of people who care about the environment and maybe you want to pay more for that. Well, that's why I say we have the power to make some decisions that can influence the sustainability of the tourism industry. Because I have, one of the worst things about the project we've just done is reading the tourism studies that have been done. This is the most studied industry in the history of Prince Edward Island. And they do all kinds of surveys every year. And every year they number crunch in different ways. So they can categorize the demographics, age, income, interest, the personality type, etc. So yes, 
if the surveys are reliable, you can target. But right now, what's, uh, what's the tourism slogan for right now? It's um, Come find your island. something about mainlanders, though. Oh. But for a number of years, it was the gentle island. But you know what our message was in 1899? The very same. Come to Prince Edward Island, the, the gentle pastoral landscape where the rhythms of life are slower, where people are more authentic, where there is a pastoral people rooted in a pastoral landscape. You can come here and get away from it all. What we don't know is how many people can get away from it all before they're all here. <laughs> now, no tough questions. Uh, I have a three-part question. <laughs> the first part is, why didn't I get top billing? Uh, the second is, why didn't we tell the audience that we're having a major exhibit at the Confederation Center of the Arts in 2021? And the third one is, and this is sincere, because my, as you know, my part of this book has been more of the early stuff, and I'd love to do that. Um, the boring part. So, my question is, um, do you find, are you finding in the late 20th and early 21st century, do you find uh, a sincere interest in bringing, uh, I don't know, people of color or gay people to DEI or, or minorities in a way that I know from the earlier time just was not there? I mean, the first person of color who shows up in the Travel guides is Michael Jordan from the Wax Museum, and that's around 2000. And there's no <laughs> not a one. So I'm just wondering if you think that there's sincere effort on the part of the tourism industry, including the tourism department. So an environmental history question. <laughs> yeah, turn the screen back up. I, I was curious. I was thinking about that, Alan, because we've talked about it. Uh, this slide from the current tourism website yeah. um, is a beach scene with, a a beach scene with yeah. several people of color. Okay. So I'm not sure how you measure sincerity, um, but I do think that the island society, the demographics of the society and cultural attitudes are becoming more inclusive as the population on PEI is becoming more inclusive and diverse. And so there are some efforts being made to recognize that the desired tourist in PEI isn't necessarily Caucasian, white, and English speaking. It wasn't even easy to find models of color in the time. Yeah, Carol is working. So, but as we have discovered, um, yeah, there was an implicit <coughs> assumption about what the right kind of tourist was. Marianne, I'm going to come back to you, but there's a gentleman who had his hand up here earlier, and I kind of jumped, so my apologies. Um, so, in terms of history and environment, not just environment, but tourism, um, how did the Confederation Bridge change uh, the before and after? Okay, well, I've written another article about that. Um, another lecture for next That would probably one of, be one of the themes that we tackle in the exhibit, on tourism at the Confederation Center coming up in 2021, <laughs> <laughs> um, where Alan will be receiving top billing, uh, as opposed to being put in, in, in brackets, because I didn't know it was coming until last night. Um, no, getting back seriously to your question, the Confederation Bridge was a lightning rod for a metaphysical debate, as well as an economic debate, over its impact on Prince Edward Island its impact on identity, its impact on culture, its impact on the economy. Tourism generally was very pro, you know, I'm sorry, bridge, or pro, you know, link. Um, because the ethos of the 90s was we need more people, and while some tourism advocates were saying, the boat ride to Prince Edward Island is part of the tourist experience. In fact, Alan and I have published an article about the right Okay, passage, the passage to Prince Edward Island as part of the experience of an island. The visceral, tangible passage over water tells you that you've come to an island. So people were saying, no, that's an important part of the tourist experience. And other people were saying, not if you have to wait six or eight hours to get the goddamn boat. <laughs> um, so there was a prediction that tourism would go up 
And in the year of the bridges opening, tourism went over a million for the first time. There was a huge spike in tourism, which lasted for two or three years until everybody in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia had seen the bridge. And then, well, there was also a, there was also a recession, so tourism numbers flattened out. But it did have an immediate impact. Uh, people said the tourist, or I'm sorry, that the bridge would be a tourist attraction in and of itself. Has there ever been anything more boring to drive across, <laughs> unless you're in a Mack truck? Uh, but I know that uh, I've done some tours uh, on buses from cruise ships, and the fixed link is one of the stops. Uh, so it is a tourist attraction. There's a question at the back, and then yeah, we'll Marianne, I thought, did you have, or was it Emma? Yeah, it was you? just to answer, uh, um, Yes. Uh, just, uh, I think that, like, And it was sincere. It was part of the first Canada mandate. <laughs> um, but it is interesting that uh, trying to trying to target different groups. Another you know buzzword I think Carol you'd agree now is experiential tourism and authentic island experiences. As if some things that happen to you on PI aren't authentic, like someone you're breaking into your car and stealing your change. But other experiences, like going clam, are somehow authentic island experiences. But all, all joking aside, experiential tourism is rooted in the environment. It's now rooted it's, in doing things in the landscape. Now it's got to be transformational as well. Yes. <laughs> Transformational. If your life has not changed by coming to Prince Edward Island, you may as well stay home. I'm wondering why they don't use that as a tourism slogan. <laughs> Transform or your money back. You know this is being videotaped, right? <laughs> I've already gotten in trouble. Well, yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. about in the 70s, trying to, um, to control what people would see from a passing car. And uh, 
the landscape is changing on Prince Edward Island, is changing in subtle ways that are not necessarily immediately apparent. And so, uh, farm consolidation, the elimination of hedgerows, is changing the agricultural viewscape. But I, about a decade ago, when I gave the first lecture I ever gave based on our tourism you know, project, I said we may get to the point where we're paying, as a tourist industry, the farmers to farm. Because it's farmers, it's agriculture that created the combination of woodlot, field, and stream that is so pleasing to the eye that tourists are viewing when they look out their car window. And the number of farms on Prince Edward Island has plummeted in the last seven years. There were 12,000 farms on Prince Edward Island in 1941. Today, there are probably fewer than 700 business farms, as opposed to people listed in a tax return as a farmer. And they're maintaining the landscape that we still sell. That landscape is changing. Um, even when farms grow back up in woods, in forest, I can remember taking friends from Ottawa to my home in Newport, driving from Cardigan down through your Mitchell River, and that, in my father's time, that was farmscape, and you could see all the way down to the Cardigan River. It had all grown back up. And I was like, this is a stretch of the most mediocre you know, landscape on Prince Edward Island. And my friends went, this is so beautiful. <laughs> Seal River? You've got to be kidding. Um, so, comes back to how much do we try to dictate or control what people see and experience, or how we package it. I mean, a lot of our books concerned with marketing and imaging of Prince Edward Island. But in some essential ways, the pastoral landscape is the same. In some essential ways. But if you know the landscape, you know it's not the same. You wouldn't be drive, well, you wouldn't be taking the drive from North River corner to the end of off the bypass at the other end, as far as driving through there, you wouldn't know there was a farm on any of you. Yeah, Charlottetown's uh, reach uh, is spreading in the same way that Toronto's reach is spread. Just the scale is different. Uh, some of the best farmland in Prince Edward Island is in the outskirts of Summerside and Charlottetown, and most of them are growing apartment buildings now. It's a different kind of cash crop. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. One, two, and then Claire in the back, and then we'll probably wrap it up. So, yeah, go okay. ahead. Yeah. Claire will get the last question. Claire can have the last question. <laughs> no pressure, Claire. Uh, I was going to ask you about the change in the uh, dynamics with regard to concerts. I remember in 1970, there was a, a protest. 1971. 71. Junction 71. Junction. No more, no gatherings of more than 10 people. Now we have 60,000 or so coming to Cavendish. What's the history that's happened here? What a wonderful comparison. Again, it's a tourism thing, not necessarily environmental tourism. Yes, in 1971, to prevent an island equivalent of Woodstock, <laughs> called Junction 71, with notoriously wild, unruly acts like Edward Bear, Bruce Coburn, um, Sam Minglewood, or maybe Sam Moon, rather. Um, we passed an act which put at the discretion of the Attorney General public gatherings. And we were dubbed by time the uptight little island. <laughs> Context is everything, right? It is at the middle of the hippie era. There's a lot of concern about drug use in an island where the drug of choice was alcohol. Um, the government overreacted. They were mocked. Uh, the act was not in place for very long. But one of the other major trends in tourism in the last 15 years is event tourism. Attracting short stay visitors for events. And they did not pick the heavy <coughs> metal scene for Cavendish. They picked the country and western kind of scene. You know, that as a genre. And government pumped significant amounts of money into promoting that. So in 30 years, the attitude towards concerts had changed, and we weren't as uptight. Johnson, I don't know if you've 
than that Cavendish to perform. Uh, Once or twice, I think. Yeah. Um, but it, it is a different vibe, but it causes problems, right? Uh, but it is at least an adaptation to a music that they think is more s suited to the culture. Even though my rock in a history course, a lot of students would admit that they're fans of country and western music. Uh, but they are. <laughs> um, event, event tourism is a difficult one as well. It's like cruise ship tourism. It has an, a, like a significant impact, but very narrow. And event tourism just gets people to come for a couple of days. And they mostly come from next door. We keep trying to attract people from Ontario and New England, and apparently the United States and Hawaii. Um, and yet, most of our tourists come from nearby. And for them, coming over for a concert in Cavendish is an ideal weekend excursion. So it's very clever in a way, even though I'm not a country and western fan. Or <coughs> Yeah, CZ Top. Yeah. I was thinking of Bruce Springsteen, Stephanie. If Bruce Springsteen came to PEI, I would be there. Um, okay, we had. There's a, a question here, questions. and then Claire at the back. Oh, so, yeah. Where was it? Let me move you? over here so that I can. Uh, I, I don't know how this applies, but your, your, your book ends around 1990, you're saying? 1997. 1997. But there's an epilogue that covers the last oh, 15 my, years. My question is that if your book were to end, then. 2020 or 2015, 2020 are are today, and would 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 that include the effect that tourism is having on society and housing in particular, and the issue of Airbnb? Uh -huh. <laughs> I want to touch on it's a touchy subject. Oh, yes. it's a touchy subject. It is a touchy subject, but again, uh, it actually is mentioned in the epilogue okay. of the manuscript that among the challenges, Airbnbs, um, I have no wisdom to offer on that front, but it is a definite trend that undercuts tourism operators who do accommodations who actually are licensed and pay all kinds of fees and regulations. Uh, the, the concept has evolved from someone who's got a spare room, who's going to be at the cottage for a while, that can make a few extra bucks, to people buying you know, houses on Prince Edward Island solely to use for air. So what will happen is the government will ultimately step in and you know, regulate them so that they will cost more or less the same as staying anyplace else, and the tourists will suffer, but tourist operators will have a better chance. That's my <coughs> thought about what will happen. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, when people are buying homes, not to live in, but to rent them in this unofficial economy, <coughs> then government will have to step in. So, that's my thought. Last but not least, Claire. What are your thoughts about the impact of the writings of Ellen Montgomery and the current interest in the character Anne at um, television? There is a character in the Montgomery books that we don't often identify, and the character is the island, the PEI. So the character of Anne is attractive. The love of the books is a combination of a love of Anne and the landscape that she lives and moves in. So the Montgomery books did a lot to entrench and put in place an image of Prince Edward Island that answered well the tourist needs, or the needs of tourism. Um, pastoral landscape with the pastoral people. I often argue about when Anne of Green Gables is set. Well, is it 1890s? Is it 1870s? It's kind of timeless. So, only a few years after the book Anne of Green Gables appeared in 1908, tourists were coming to Prince Edward Island without our advertising for them to make a pilgrimage to the sites associated with the novel. 
And by the 1920s, local operators in the province were putting up convenient identifiers in the landscape, often, according to LNM, incorrectly identifying some of the places in the landscape. Every time there is a significant new and artistic release, there is a bump in tourism on PBI. Whether that's the musical Anne of Green Gables, the Sullivan film was perhaps the greatest example. There was a big spike in tourism uh, because of the Sullivan films and their worldwide reach. I don't know if Anne with an E is having the same effect because it's very gritty and it's using Anne to serve us a modern agenda and it's not really in the spirit of the Anne books. So they, they, it may be quite a good show, but it's not the image of Prince Edward Island that people fall in love with. In fact, you wouldn't really know whether that was on PEI or Vancouver. Um, so Anne tourism has been extremely important, literary tourism has been extremely important. But it also spills over into landscape tourism because the island is a character in the books. And so, yeah, that's another dimension of environmental new tourism. What a great place to end on. Thank Home, everybody. Yes. Uh, let me go down.